in this part, we'll talk about the uh, the um, arterioles. And I just found kind of like bumped into this picture where it says that when we're cold, the um, capillaries and arterioles are going to expand to bring more blood into the area and warm us up. And that is actually incorrect, okay? What expands are the arterioles, not the capillaries. Remember, capillaries do not have smooth muscles. So, um, you know, that kind of bugged me, so I thought I should bring it up. Okay, so let's talk about the arterioles. The arterioles, remember, are responsible for, um, they have lots of smooth muscles. They are responsible for determining the amount of blood that will reach each individual organ, depending on the needs of the organ. And obviously these needs can change from time to time. So for instance, if you're sleeping, your skeletal muscles do not need a lot of blood. So these arterioles can constrict and um, divert that blood to other organs that might need it while you're sleeping. So that would be the function of arterioles. The diameters of the arterioles are controlled by the nervous system, by hormones, and um, by local chemicals. So depending on the metabolic needs of the organ, any change in the chemistry of the cells can also change the diameters of these arterioles. And let's take a look at that. Um, this leads us to a relationship between flow and pressure. Flow is the amount of blood flowing into the um, organs and pressure. There are two different kind of pressures that are acting here that we have your systolic, you know, the um, arterial blood pressure. So the amount of the pressure of the blood coming into the organ. And there is also the pressure inside of the organ itself. So um, if you want to, you can change the resistance that is um, to blood flow by changing the diameter of the arterioles. So vasoconstriction of the arterioles will increase the resistance to blood flow, which eventually obviously would decrease blood flow. So what do arterioles have to do if they want to increase the blood flow to an organ? Well, there's several different ways we could do that. On the arteriolar level, we can vasodilate, which means to relax the smooth muscle fibers that will decrease resistance to blood flow, which eventually leads to increased blood flow to organs. Um, another way we can increase blood flow to an organ would be to increase the blood pressure. And I've got a question here, like what are the different ways to, that we can increase blood pressure coming out of the heart? Well, we could increase the strobe volume. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system, for example, can increase the uh, force of contraction from the ventricles, it could increase our venous return to the heart, which would eventually um, translate into an increase in stroke volume and increase in cardiac output. So if you're not familiar with all of these terms, you definitely recommend, definitely recommend that you go back and uh, review those definitions because they are extremely important. So these are ways how pretty much the heart can change the blood pressure. But on the arteriolar level, we can change the... Um, flow to blood vessels by either dilating or constricting the arterioles. Flow autoregulation, which means, again, going back to the functions of the, these arterioles, how can we regulate the flow of blood going to individual organs? Because, let's be honest, at any given time, not all of, the or, all of our organs do not have the same... Um, need for blood. So again, going back to that sleeping example, when you're asleep, your skeletal muscles don't need lots of blood. You know, contrast that with exercising. When you're exercising, there are certain organs that do need a lot of blood, like the skeletal muscles, the heart, for example. So those are arter the arterioles supplying the skeletal muscles and supplying the heart are going to dilate to increase the flow to these areas. While other organs during exercise, for example, the urinary bladder, um, the, the um, intestines don't need lots of blood. So we could constrict, we will, um, what the body does is that it, the smooth muscles of those arterioles contract leading to constriction, vasoconstriction, and all of that blood can be diverted away 
from the kidneys or from the bladder, from the intestine over to the other organs that actually need it at that point, which again would be your skeletal muscles and heart. So that is what autoregulation means, that at any given time, the needs of the organs um, change, and that again is the function of the arterioles. And there's different ways how we the body regulates that. There are intrinsic controls by the local metabolites, for example, accumulation of carbon dioxide, accumulation of different waste products, and that is going to change the diameter of these local arterioles. And there's also extrinsic control that is by the autonomic nervous system. And you see here that this is one of three slides. So when you talk about flow autoregulation, you wanna go over all three of these slides. Now, first slide, the second slide, I mean, talks about the intrinsic or the local control. Okay, so um, what happens is that when we are exercising, so I keep on going back to that example, there is going to be an accumulation of carbon dioxide, of uh, lactic acid, for example, so of different metabolites, and that accumulation of metabolites and the decrease of the oxygen, because we are using all of the oxygen coming, that is going to lead to um, a reflex dilation of the arterioles. And again, dilation of the arterioles is due to the relaxation of the smooth muscles in the arteriolar wall. That is known as active hyperemia, which will eventually increase the blood flow to organs. Um, another way that the lo there's this local control would be due to um, changes in blood pressure. So when the arterial pressure goes down in an organ, okay, there's a decrease in the blood flow and that decrease in blood flow, again, is going to lead to the accumulation of metabolites, um, the decrease in the oxygen to the cells or hypoxia to the cells, and that will lead to arteriolar dilation of organs in these organs and restoring the blood flow back to normal. So that is known as flow autoregulation. So you have active hypremia and flow autoregulation. They basically both occur due to the accumulation of metabolites and the local hypoxia that's happening. Um, one of them, though, begins with increase in the metabolic needs, while the other is due to um, low pressure in the organ. The extrinsic factors, and these are that would be under the control, basically, of the sympathetic nervous system. And you can see here that, again, going back to that exercise um, example, where we want to divert blood away from organs and divert, divert that blood towards other organs. So some arterioles are going to constrict while others are going to dilate. Well, the sympathetic system uses um, norepinephrine from the sympathetic postganglionic fibers. And there's also epinephrine coming from the adrenal medulla. Now, how is it that, you know, these two... Um, neurotransmitters, how is it that they can perform two different functions on the same organ? Well, that is because they are going to stimulate two different kinds of receptors. So let's take the sympathetic postganglionic neurons first. Those release norepinephrine, and norepinephrine will reach the um, blood vessels and stimulate the alpha adrenergic receptors. Stimulation of alpha adrenergic receptors causes vasoconstriction. So the alpha adrenergic receptors are going to lead to the contraction of the smooth muscles, leading to vasoconstriction. So you will find these alpha adrenergic, for example, um, in areas where you want to divert blood away from them. So for example, maybe in the intestine, okay? When you're exercising, you definitely don't need blood going to the intestine, so norepinephrine will stimulate these alpha adrenergic receptors causing constriction. Now less blood will be going to the intestine and we have, we can divert that blood to the lungs maybe, to the um, skeletal muscles and to the heart. And that would be due to the stimulation of the beta-2 adrenergic receptors. Okay, those are going to cause relaxation of the smooth muscle fibers causing vasodilation. Okay, and that again is how these two um, different neurotransmitters are going to able 
to affect the same organs, which are the smooth muscle fibers, causing either a constriction or dilation. And that's because they stimulate different receptors in the different organs. So alpha adrenergic leads to constriction, while beta 2 um, adrenergic leads to dilation. Now the endothelial cells, which are the inner lining of the blood vessels, those also have a say in the um, dilation or the constriction of the smooth muscle fibers. The endothelial cells secrete different hormones and they act on their neighboring smooth cells. So these are known as paracrine agents. For example, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gas neurotransmitter and when it's released, it leads to the relaxation of the smooth muscle fibers leading to vasodilation and increase in the blood flow coming to the organ. And we've talked about this when we talked about erection in the male reproductive system. These are all of the functions of the endothelial cells. So these are the physical lining that for, makes the endocardium in the heart and it continues to become the endothelium in the blood vessels where blood cells um, cannot stick to them. It's a very smooth fiber, a uh, very smooth layer. It's made out of simple squamous epithelium. It makes a barrier, okay, but, is a, but it is a selectively permeable barrier where it allows for the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide and different um, um, metabolic products or waste products as well. We already mentioned that it can secrete paracrine agents like prostacyclin, for example, and nitric oxide. And when there's an injury to a blood vessel, the stimulation or the, the stimulus to, to repair the damage occurs due to the growth factors that are made or that are secreted by these endothelial cells. So these endothelial cells produce growth factors in response to damage. And it also mediates angiogenesis. Angiogenesis means to generate or to produce new blood vessels. Um, angiogenesis is going to be needed definitely as we grow and as we make more and more cells, those cells are going to need capillaries. So that angiogenesis is important. The factors or the, the uh, growth factors that stimulate angiogenesis are produced by the endothelial cells. Um, angiogenesis is also a thing that happens when we are make when we if we develop a tumor, and one of the ways to treat these tumors would be well maybe if we cut the blood supply going to these tumors that would lead to the death of the tumors. <coughs> so you can find that some of the um, drugs to treat tumors would be to cut the blood supply to um, act on this angiogenesis factor. Endothelial cells also, um, if you go back to blood clotting, we talked about or we will talk about how platelets release, how there's a release of serotonin and serotonin is going to lead to the accumulation and at clumping of platelets. Well, that is prevented or regulated by different substances released by the endothelial cells. The endothelial cells also release cytokines, which help in um, different immune responses. So you'll see that the endothelial cells are not just there as a physical barrier between tissue and blood. It has lots and lots of different functions. And that will take us to our next tutorial about capillaries. So I will see you folks there.